So let's start straight away with a little bit more about yourselves and what you do, and then we'll dive into the question, just build on what Holm said. So Anna, do you want to go first? My name is Anna Skoglund. I'm a partner at Goldman Sachs. I work in our uh, investment banking division, um, which where I've spent my whole career. Um, in addition to that, I also sit on the board of TNC, which is the Nature Conservancy, which is one of the largest NGOs in the world working for biodiversity and nature conservation. First, I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce. I've been here before. I was just at a um, UN meeting yesterday and the day before. I'm going to be at the OECD next week. And I've taken more away here than I got yesterday. And by the way, that was a meeting with financial centers from around the world. And I wish they had been here to hear some of the panelists, some of the solutions, some of the policy things were real, effective, and they're impactful, which we're going to talk about today. My background, uh, again, my name is Michael Sharon. Up until a year ago, I spent 10 years at the Bank of England. I came in within a week with Mark Carney. And I, if you had a, enough time, we could talk about everything from the Paris agreements, the TCFD, the, how it all started. It was extraordinarily exciting, but we've stalled a little bit on some of these things. So I've spent 10 years in the policy side. But before that, I spent 25 years in debt capital markets doing um, investment banking, leverage buyouts. So I cover both how do you invest, how do you make returns, but also looking at the policy challenges at the highest level. And I did have the great honor representing the UK as the chairperson, the co-chairperson of the G20 Sustainable Finance Group, which tried to bring in, and we brought actually SEB into some of our work in, under the Argentinian G20 on how do we come up with sustainable investment products that actually drive the industries that many of you represent here. So it's a real pleasure to be back and it's great to listen to all of you. I told you we need five parts for this, but <laughs> uh, we'll try to cover now. So, but Anna, I want to start with you, given that you have uh, been with Goldman Sachs for a long time. What would you say the trend has been during the years in terms of the clients that you're working with and sustainability? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, First of all, we've seen an acceleration. I very much agree with the, the previous speakers in the sense that um, the private sector has has clearly um, honed in on this issue mm. increasingly, exponentially increasingly mm. uh, over the last few years. The way we get involved is um, multiple facets. So we are seeing the development of a carbon credit market. I 100% agree. We need a fully functioning marketplace to yeah. basically be able to uh, to externalize externalize the value of nature, but also creating a cost of using that asset, which is nature. Mm. Um, so the, clearly there's, there's a focus on that. We've also um, worked a lot in sustainable finance, i.e. we create debt instruments, which has um, a cost which is in interest, but also as a certain amount of climate goals mm. that they need to focus on. We also have on our asset management side, a dedicated effort in investing mm. in impact in nature. Um, we own a part of a company called Northwood up in Sweden, uh, for example, which is a battery company. Um, and then I would say there's a very big advisory function. Mm. And uh, one of the things that I think is interesting is I am 100% convinced that if we're going to solve this, mm. There needs to be collaboration between private and public, uh, mm. which uh, Michael was just referring to. And I think it's, if you think about it, it's sort of a triangle with people, nature, climate, and in the middle of that, in my view, is finance, entrepreneurship, and technology. It's the only way we're going to be able to drive everything together and drive solutions which are sustainable, not only for climate and nature, but also for people. Finance, entrepreneurship, and technology. I really like that. Yeah. And I mean, you have seen both of those worlds and still continue to be in them. Um, how, how would you say that the collaboration is? Well, first of all, Anna, you're absolutely correct. So if you think about policy starts to set your incentives in place, some of your global macro incentives. And some of the speakers today have already talked about that the playing fields aren't exactly equal. So if you're you know, a very innovative company and you're spending a tremendous amount, and let's, talk, let's be honest, it's CapEx, it's R&D. Those are the things that actually draw money from your EBITDA, your free cash flow, and your valuation. And if you're doing the right thing, but your competitors right now are not, mm. and policymakers haven't given you an even playing field. And one of them, by the way, is by no means the only solution. So let's talk about a carbon tax. 
know, basically across. So all of a sudden, everybody's paying for equally or a certain amount, mm. at least in a jurisdiction for that. Then all of a sudden, you've got an even playing field. So that's number one. Mm. Policy people have to provide incentives. And incentives are both negative and positive. By the way, if you put a carbon tax in place, you could also put a tax rebate around mm. CapEx. It's tied directly to green innovation. Mm. So you're giving both carrots and sticks. So policy plays a really important role on that, both at the global as well as on the regional level and the right down to your country. Obviously, technology, there is no sustainability. I can tell you unequivocally without technology. And we've seen it today, whether it's in the ships that are using modern sails, whether it's taking a solar panel that's gone from 13% efficiency to 25% efficiency, you cannot make at pace and scale the transition that we need without technology driving the sustainability. If your idea of technology is making Angry Birds 7 mm -hmm. or 8 or whatever they're on now, that's a failed industry. But if you're trying to use your technology to make industrial, whether it's carbon-free cement or as in Sweden is brilliant at the two companies that make green steel, that's technology. Mm -hmm. And then the final piece, what Anna does and what I did for many years is finance, because you cannot finance CapEx. You cannot, I mean, you cannot do CapEx or R&D or innovation or build companies or expand companies without capital. And that's what the financial system is there for. But again, they benefit from an even playing field as well, because some of their clients are doing this. They want to make sure they get their loans back. Mm. And so consequently getting that that trifecta that you so aptly described, working together and providing all those things are what are going to drive sustainability at pace mm. and scale. And if we don't do it at pace and scale, we're not going to get there. Mm. Just to add to that, though, I actually met a game developer the other day that is working on making games more change behavior through games. And Angry Bird is actually including more climate change content to kind of brainwash people into taking action. Okay, but so I want to know: does is his is his data um, center? That runs off of is it a green one or a brown one basically are basically the data centers that drive angry birds powered by solar and wind or by renewable that's the real that's the thing they can it can be a nudge but ultimately <laughs> if they're not if they're not by the way that nudge unit got spun off and privatized um, <laughs> it did it's a spin unit yeah it's a spin unit but it's got privatized but ultimately if they're not powering angry birds and the development in that off of green it's nice that they're nudging but it'd be really nice if they were powering it in a green way. I agree. I don't think that they will solve, solve the world, but save yeah. the world. Yeah. But uh, then also, Anna, uh, are there any sectors then that you've been working with? We talk a lot about technology here. Are there any sectors that you see are more forward leaning when it comes to those more sustainable finance products? I wouldn't say, you know, other sectors per se. There's, of course, if you, for example, work in business services and mm -hmm. there's all kind of, someone mentioned earlier and 100% agree, to be able to, to do this, we need to be able to A, agree on a metric, how we basically assess this, and B, be able to measure it. Uh, and the policies uh, needs to be sort of creating as much as we can at, at sort of common playing mm -hmm. field. So I would say there are sectors, if you divide them up broadly in three sectors, there are sectors which are, you know, emitting, mm -hmm. like net emitters. There are sectors which are which are helping, measuring, and controlling this, and then there, there are sort of neutral sectors. We spent. I was in New York last week because I actually did an interview um, at Goldman with Jennifer Morris, who's the CEO of TNC, and there was also happened to be Climate Week in. So UN was in town in New York, and Jan uh, came back from a discussion that she had with the food industry, mm -hmm. um, and obviously agriculture and the food industry are massive. Um, creators of emissions yep. uh, and we need to change how we eat we need to change how we create what we eat um, and I think what is so exciting to hear I don't want to sort of single out one sector sure the you know energy sector is uh, you know often called a big, big culprit on the other hand we still need them uh, you know to power homes I mean we have to be a little bit pragmatic in the in the sort of uh, in this transition period what I thought was really encouraging to hear on the food industry is to hear how these big food corporations saying, listen, we don't want to take it on balance sheet because et cetera. However, how can we participate to finance mm -hmm. some of the you know, regenerative um, agriculture um, companies or to create technology or how we can fund, you know, if you're going to go down to Israel, there's a massive industry. Israel is known for tech, technology, software, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's a big sector there looking at 
um, substitute protein sectors, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to single out one sector. I think, candidly, I think all sectors have to participate. Yep. And I am a pragmatist and an optimist. So what does that mean? I rather see, you know, some small steps uh, because often it says, well, is it enough? Is it quick enough, et cetera? Well, what's the option? Let's take, mm. even if the small steps, let's take them mm. uh, and move in the right direction. Um, so that's what I would answer to there. Yeah. And there are so many new aspects, everything from regulation to the market that is introduced now that maybe is not covered in financial education. So many people are not equipped with understanding all these abbreviations and so on. You've done great work in terms of also supporting board members to actually be on this journey. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, no, I, I sit on several boards, but also I've got the great, great privilege of the World Economic Forum has a group of, of people who are, are experts in um, sustainable governance. So I sit on that. And what's interesting is one of my fellow members has been working in the um, professional recruitment agency for years. And he said, the pool of fish that we actually pull people onto boards on is a disaster. Yeah. I mean, basically we're not, it, forget just diversification it has to be broader than that. You have to bring people from a tremendous amount of perspective. It, it's not just age, it's not just sex. It's about knowledge around sustainability because if every single industry has to aim for a net zero by mm. 2050, which their countries have obligated them to, mm. if that whole board doesn't have a good understanding what that means for their industry, mm. they've got the wrong board. Mm. And it's a really difficult thing. I mean, you've, I'm sure you've seen it at Goldman's, I've seen it in the financial service industry. I can train a banker pretty quickly to understand because they're pretty good at numbers on the whole. If I say, look at run in your P&L statement, put in your cost of goods sold, COGS, put in a, a carbon line, just put a number in, run it over seven years, see what happens to your, your free cash flow. They very quickly start understanding. Mm. And then you throw plastics in, then you throw other things, and very quickly they start getting what that means. Mm. But your board members need to understand that, and they're the ones that set the strategies. As I said, I've been incredibly inspired by the, the, the talks here, and, and I'd like to actually um, shout out a couple of things that really play in well here. The young lady who won the, um, the award for the um, startup, okay. she talked about... Um, how 37% of ca cattle or beef or, or protein is in dog foods. Well, what if you take that a couple steps further, if you knew how much of the um, of the of the crops grown around the world are used for basic yeah. cattle yeah. and for pigs and that, and then no, no, keep going back one further, the water used for those crops to feed that it would absolutely astound you. So if you're a board member, you need to start thinking about all these different things. It's not only the initial impact, it's the second order and the third order effects. And I would argue if you've got a board that switched on, the alpha opportunities as you start rethinking, you know, and we talk broadly, and I don't know if we'll have time to talk about on the city side about how you can rethink, you know, mobility. But on mm -hmm. the agricultural side, protein at some point is most likely going to be coming from basically cells, stem cells done in laboratories. By the way, I did meet an Israeli company who's doing sushi grade salmon already on that. Two is going to be plant-based and three bugs, which by the way, are very popular already in Asia. And I spend a lot of time in Singapore. Singaporean government's already approved um, lab-based um, chicken, chicken and it's yep. already out on the market. Mm -hmm. So how you rethink and how that impacts the business models. Mm -hmm. And if your board members aren't horizon scanning, aren't thinking about where your expenses, where your supply chains are, and where the path of travel is, and how it all ties in to your obligations based on your country's treaty signing on the Paris Agreement. They're not on top of your company, and they're not directing you well. Yeah. I've heard that there are even some companies actually put nature on their board. Hmm. So nature has one of the board seats as well. Um, so it's a lot of things happening on board level, which is great because that's, of course, where the major decisions are. That's where all the strategy comes from. Yeah, true. And and we talked a little bit before as well that it's a lot about education and moving people faster. We often also get stuck with the gender question when it comes to the finance sector. But there is something you've been really wo working on to broadening that. I mean, I couldn't agree more with the, this whole idea of diversity. Mm. Um, and it's, it's diversity because... Um, from a diversity of thought perspective, from an expertise perspective, but also candidly, if we're gonna, someone mentioned, uh, I think, about Turkmenistan, and you know, what's the point if you know to do something in the UK if you have you know someone you know emitting, 
emitting uh, as much you know, somewhere else. But if we take a step back and we look at who is responsible for these emissions, uh, there is a sort of question of fairness and global fairness. And I think um, by having those perspectives, and we see it, I see it a lot in my TNC work, but I also see it at Goldman Sachs, um, we have to have a much more broader perspective on what is global fairness mm. and how do we bring in the different voices. Now, having said all that, we also have to be pragmatic and move things forward. So it, it's a natural tension between mm. those two. Mm. Which it can never be easy. No, nope. that's weird. Nope. If it would be easy, we would have solved it already. No. I want to invite some questions also now. It's the final time you have for questions. I see one here on the left hand side. Um, thank you. Um, so it's Koloska from Mr. Sweden again. Uh, <laughs> so I have a question. I, I used to work in the uh, sustainable finance industry, and it's quite often a debate whether you should divest from you know, the bad companies, the emitters and so on, or where you should really engage with them more. Do you have any any thoughts on that, you know, trade-off? Is it better to not get involved with the bad ones or should you get on board and really make them change? Can I take that? Yeah, and I would love to hear your perspective. I think you should talk as much as possible with everyone. Um, and I think if you, if you again, like take an example, let's stop cutting down the trees in the Amazon. And then you realize that there's a whole host of people who rely on that to feed their families, et cetera. And if we don't come up with a solution, and I'll give you an example of this, um, TNC bought a big plot of land in the Maya forest. The Maya forest in South America is one of the most biodiverse remaining part of the, of the rainforest outside the Amazon. And TNC was um, basically competing for this plot of land. Uh, with a group of farmers. And um, and if you look at the Belize, you will see a lot of, of the rainforest has been cut down for farming. Again, going back to the role of farming. Um, what TC has then done is they have bought the plot of land and they have externalized the value of that forest uh, by selling carbon credits on to corporates. And then they're taking those carbon credits to reinvest in regenerative agriculture around this plot of land. So what does that do? It basically aligns incentives. And I think ultimately taking a step back, it goes back to the point of diversity mm -hmm. and sort of global fairness. It needs to be sustainable in a basis. It's very easy to say like, let's now stop and cutting down anything. But if you don't look at the livelihoods of, of the you know, local communities in those areas, it doesn't work. So I would say, yes, we need to engage with the food industry and the farmers and the energy companies and any company, because why wouldn't you? Um, I am aware of the debate and like, isn't this greenwashing and et cetera. I just think uh, it is idealistic and non-pragmatic to say that we shouldn't engage because I just don't believe it will work. What are you? No, I, I think you bring up, you know, absolutely um, legitimate and, and important points. But to answer your question at the BOE, the great thing is, in some ways, they handed up, they being the politicians, handed up to the regulators, the financial regulators, some of the obligations. So they said, well, look at, we want you to talk to the banks who can then talk to their clients to see how they're doing, as opposed to just saying, there's a carbon tax now, which mm -hmm. would have been, as an economist, a far more efficient way of doing it. But ultimately, less, politicians- Less politically viable? Yes, less politically viable. But ultimately, I think what's great now, five, six, seven years ago, people didn't weren't producing very good sustainable development plans for the companies. Now there's no excuse. TCFD has been around for a long time now. It's now actually mandatory. It's law here and it's becoming law in a lot of other places. So I would engage with those and say, I want to see your sustainability plan and I want to see you hit your targets every single year. And they need to be aligned with your company, your country's, mm -hmm. you know, by basically about 2030, pretty much everyone here needs to have reduced their carbon footprint by roughly 50% from their baseline. So you say, all right, tell, show us your baseline, show us your forward-looking plan, what are your targets, mm -hmm. and then make sure they hit them. That's where it's a combination of both engagement, but you need to prove that you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's the balance we couldn't do five, six, seven years ago. There's no excuse any longer for people not being able to demonstrate they're absolutely reducing it because there's a lot of people using a lot of smoke and mirrors to like if you're an auto company say look I've got my per unit down from 7000 to 5000 per unit but now you're selling 
200,000 more units. So your absolute amount of carbon has gone up. Mm. And the planet's not asking you for your relative reduction. They're asking for an absolute reduction. So there's a lot, it's complicated. But I think engagement is absolutely the way forward, but they need to prove. Mm. One final question is all we have time for, unfortunately. We have one in the far back. Thank you. The, the question I have is in relation to pension companies, which of course invest, uh, certainly in this country, quite heavily um, in uh, fossil, fuel, fossil fuel companies, which return a high dividend. And I suppose my question is, what incentive do I have or even my pension company have to invest sustainably sustainably if a, another company with a fossil fuel background or an emitting background produces a higher dividend yield? I'll, take that. I'll start with that. First of all, um, that's, a, that's a brilliant question because everyone talks about right here, right now, today. Mm. And ultimately, um, it is there is there are laws in place, so they have to stop emitting by 2050. And a lot of their business models aren't going to succeed. But most people don't care about that in the short term. Um, even amongst oil and gas companies, are not all created equal. If you were a low cost extractor with a highly refined type of fuel, and said, "Look at if here's a let's say tar sands at the bottom, and this is a low extraction high one." and that we've got to have an X percent over this period of time, we're no longer going to put any money into extracting. We're going to become a dividend machine, and we are basically in runoff mode. That's an interesting discussion for people to have, because we do need to have a certain amount of it, but we don't want the expensive, high to, expensive to refine, dirty stuff. That's, that's, a, that's an interesting game. But there's a lot of other sectors to the world and economy that need to be looked at that actually can be completely taken out and changed over the next few years. By the way, even the energy um, sector, I can give you a gigawatt of renewable energy now anywhere in the world, cheaper, a new one than a fossil fuel one. So when it comes to substitution, there's no reason for it whatsoever. And I guess the, 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 the most important thing, and I think you alluded to it, is insurance companies, pension funds, and sovereign wealth funds are long-term investors. So if you're good enough to basically play the game, the short and midterm and trade in and out, and by the way, I've been in financial services, God, almost 40 plus years, and I'm not smart enough to move in and out. A lot of people will tell you they are, but ultimately, if you're looking for a steady, long, consistent flow of returns over 20, 30 years, because you look from this distance very young, um, and, and, and you're investing for the future. It's as Mark said, Carney, it's a tragedy of the horizons. Everyone's looking at short-termism, and they're not looking at the long-term. Right now, the incentives are not equal. We're in a transitional period. But if you want to have a balanced portfolio of investments that are looking forward, even if you are going to have some fossil fuel ones, I'd be very selective of the ones I picked, and I'd be looking for the future-facing ones that many of them I saw here today uh, that were incredibly impressive and I think would have an even a higher rate of return. You want to add a final comment to that, Anna, before we wrap it up? No, I, I, again, I think Michael said it perfectly. Yeah, I think, uh, and there's going to be a tension. First of all, there will be tension between the short term and the long term. Um, but I think I am always a glass half full person. Mm -hmm. I don't see the point of not. Um, and there's been a lot of progress made. Yes, there's going to, and first of all, progress is never linear. It just isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at it, uh, you know, sufficiently long time, um, I think uh, basically thinking about planning for that long term, being a pragmatist in the short term that we need some of this energy coming from the oil and gas companies, but also we need to find ways of transitioning that and holding them accountable to Michael's point in terms of what they're doing. Yeah. Um, I'm optimistic and it's not going to be linear, um, but we got to make it work. So that's what I would say. And on that note, we'll have the final question. And for your benefit, and I know you arrived now, I've thrown in a music question being from Spotify as well. Oh. So 
you said you were an optimistic person as well so i want to hear that song that makes you energized and and um, happy basically but michael given you have a little bit more time to prepare i'll let you go first and leave you some time on it i mean how can you not feel happy or inspired when you hear george harrison starting with here comes the sun mm. very nice it then it also referring back to where we are regarding the dawn as well then we're yeah. close to the dawn yeah anna do you have one song Yeah, I mean, I'm Swedish, you know, so Dancing Queen. Oh. <laughs> you have three ABBA songs during the <laughs> Yeah. So with that, please give the uh, panelists a warm applause. And then Nick, please come back on stage. <laughs>